Hello and welcome to our third, our third Thursday evening education session. It's so exciting to see all of you here. And since you came on time, we want to start on time. Um, my name is Arielle. If I haven't met you, I work um, at the clinic at Tacoma Radiation as um, a health educator and health coach. Um, and I get to welcome you today. So if I don't know you, please come up to me and say hello. We also have Dr. Pivier here with us. Um, so if you have specific questions, feel free to ask her. And I get to introduce our lovely speaker, Sarah, as well. So kind of reading off of Sarah's bio, um, I wanted to say that she currently serves as a program manager for the research working group at the Plantrition Project, which was super cool because I actually saw the Plantrition Project at a national conference before I met Sarah. Um, so kind of the worlds are coming together. She also um, has a private counseling practice and she works out of Gig Harbor and she has a bit of some of her um, cards in the back if you're interested in kind of private practice there. She has a master's in science in mental health counseling, which is why she's a counselor. And she also has a few certificates in plant-based nutrition from Cornell. But most interesting, um, I find, is that she was on faculty for the Nutritional Education Institute and worked as the vice president of education and training for Joel Berman and the New York Times, who is the New York Times bestseller author of Eat to Live and the End of Dieting. So she writes extensively for like Veg News, Aloha Living Magazine. She's been interviewed by NPR and a couple of other things um, about nutrition. Her first book, and then, so she's written two books. Her first book was called Vegan in 30 Days. And then her second book, which is actually, I think where a lot of this information is coming from, is the vegetarian to vegan. So we know that vegetables are good for us. Um, and we know how to, how do we actually take that lifestyle and kind of push it all the way to the other end of the spectrum? So um, given that introduction, I also want to say that beyond vegetarian hobbies, she also enjoys reading, traveling, and fun fact, she's the inventor of the stackable gourmet that you can see on the Home Shopping Network. Um, she's married, lives in Gig Harbor, they have three cats. So welcome, <laughs> Sam. <laughs> The cats are the most important part. <laughs> can everybody hear me okay or do I need to use the microphone? In the back, can you hear? Okay, great, perfect. Okay, so I'd like to start by saying that in the times of Galileo, people thought that the sun revolved around the earth, and of course they were wrong. And in the times of Copernicus, people thought the earth was flat. I mean, that was self-evident. You could just walk to the ocean and look and see for sure the earth is flat, right? Everybody knew it, it was just an obvious fact of life. But of course, they too were wrong. And even in our generations or our parents' generations, even as early as, or recently as that, they believed that smoking was completely harmless. It was just a fun hobby and made you cool. But of course, they turned out to be very wrong about that as well. So I bring these examples up to start by saying that we've also been taught a lot of other things that today we believe to be pure fact, like um, milk does a body good, um, white meat is healthy, things like this. Um, the keto diet or the paleo diet are healthy options to lose weight. And so I would just like to purport that you come to this lecture with an open mind, remembering that in the past there have been many examples when we've been very, very wrong as a society, and I'm going to make an argument that we are wrong about the health benefits of meat and dairy as well. I'd like to start just by saying that as a medical community, I feel like we're really zoomed in, and this is what scientists love to do. We pull out our, our uh, microscopes and we start looking at what's happening and we say, wow, all of these patients with ha that have cancer, they all have elevated IGF levels and they, they have inflammatory cytokines and, and oh my gosh, their cholesterol, is in it. and we start getting all excited about these little pieces that might be fitting together because of course, we think that we might be a little bit smarter than God and we can actually create a medication and if we can just find the one thing that's causing breast cancer or the one thing that's causing high cholesterol, we can go in and fix that one thing with a medication and the patients will be fully 
fully you know, healthy again. And that's never worked. And I've worked in pharmaceutical research for many years, <clears throat> and there are a lot of great things that come out of it. But this belief that we can take something as intricate as the human body, with all of its chemical reactions that are going on and all the hormones and the enzymes and all these things that are happening, I mean, billions and billions of reactions going on in our body, and think that we can actually figure out what one thing is wrong when it's really a symphony of things that are happening. It's never just one thing. And so I think that as a medical community, we've zoomed way too far in, and I think, and I'm gonna try to make this argument today, that if we just zoom out and see the bigger picture, <clears throat> The evidence about what causes many cancers and how to treat them is in many cases already abundantly described in the medical literature. So what I'm gonna talk about today is two broad topics. One is the dangers of eating animal-based foods, and the other is the benefits of eating plant-based foods. And I'm gonna start by pointing out a quote that goes to show you that this is nothing new, because you might, when I'm done with this, lecture, you're probably going to be thinking, as many people tell me, how could we not know this? How could I have not heard this before? This is so compelling. If this is all true, how come everybody doesn't know it? And the answer is, well, we have known it for a long time. Back in 1892, a long time ago, Scientific American, which is one of the top scientific journals in our country, noted that, quote, cancer is most frequent among those branches of the human race where carnivorous or meat-eating habits prevail. So <clears throat> I want to tell you that this is nothing new. And as I was talking with the gentleman, I didn't catch your name in the front. Troy. Troy, okay, I was talking with him earlier. Um, one of the things that I'll bring back around is that by the time we're done with this lecture, and again, if you find yourself thinking, how could I have not heard this before? It makes perfect sense why very few people have heard this lecture, although more and more are starting to hear it now. And that is that the meat and dairy industries have huge you know, multi-billion dollar lobbyists. And there's no lobby for the Broccoli Council or the Collard Greens Council or the Citrus Orange Council. So <clears throat> this information has been around for a long time and it's just now really starting to gain momentum because more and more physicians, more and more researchers are starting to really push this. So they don't really have big marketing budgets for it, but because the information is so compelling, it is starting to gain traction. So I've taken this next slide from Dr. Pedier. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, this is a really great slide because it shows that about 90 to 95% of all cancers are associated with lifestyle. Lifestyle are things that we choose to do on our own. So only about five to 10% of cancers are due to genetics, which is not what most of us have been led to believe. And specifically, in addition to things like, you know, how much you smoke or drink or whether you're outside, you know, with air pollution, things like that. The biggest of all these lifestyle factors is actually diet. And diet's thought to be responsible for 35% of all cancers combined, 70% of colorectal and prostate cancers, 50% of breast, endometrial, pancreatic, and gallbladder cancers, and 20% of lung, bladder, mouth, and esophageal cancers. So this is a little bit scary, but it's also great because it's very easy to choose what you want to eat. So hopefully by the end of this lecture, you'll be compelled to make some different choices. So I'm going to start with the research against animal-based products. So why, why would you want to get rid of meat? Um, and that, when I say meat, I'm including all kinds of flesh. So that would include poultry and fish. Why would you want to get rid of dairy? Why would you want to get rid of eggs? <clears throat> and I'm going to start by telling you a story about a man named Colin Campbell. He wrote a book you may have seen called The China Study. And um, he's a really interesting guy. When he was, he was raised on a dairy farm, and when he was a young man, he really wanted to do something great with his life. And so he thought, you know, I'm really gonna try to help the starving people in the world, and I'm gonna get my PhD in protein, because if I can really figure out what the best protein is, and we can get that type of protein to starving people, hopefully we can keep them from dying of starvation. You know, like be more efficient in what kinds of food we get them, rather than just giving them a whole bunch of rice or a whole bunch of grain. So he actually devoted his life to getting his PhD. And um, as he was doing some research on, on protein, and it was, it was largely believed back then that the highest quality, quote, protein was from animals. And so he was looking up some research and he came across this study uh, done by some Indians um, in India, when I say Indians, 
Um, it was done in rats, and these rats were given a cancer-causing substance called aflatoxin, and then they were subject subjected to either a high-protein or a low-protein diet. The high-protein diet consisted of 25 or 20 percent of the calories from casein, and the low-protein diet consisted of just five percent of the calories from casein. And I want to stop for just a moment and tell you that casein is an animal-based protein, and it's found in only in animal products, but specifically in really high density in dairy products, but also is found in, in meat and, and eggs as well. So this was a casein or an animal-based protein study. So what he did is he put these rats on two different diets, and then he checked over time to see if they developed, I shouldn't say he, this group in India, checked to see if they developed cancer or precancerous lesions. If you look at the top table here, what you'll see next is that in the first study, they found that in those with the high protein diet, the 20% protein diet, 30 out of 30 of the rats developed cancer or precancerous lesions. All of the rats did. And those in the low protein diet, none of them developed cancer or precancerous lesions. And then they did a follow-up study and they looked to see how many of those animals, like how long it would take for them to die. And after 100 weeks, all of the rats in the high protein diet were dead and none of the rats in the low protein diet were dead. So, <clears throat> actually I said that backwards, but you, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> the ones that were low protein were still alive. So, um, so this became really interesting because in science, when you see results like this, that are all, what we call all or nothing results, 100% and 0%, you know, red flags start going up because this is just rarely how science works. There's usually some gray area, some wiggle room. So when we see like all of the animals died and none of the animals were alive, you start wondering like, did somebody feed this group poison on accident or like what happened? So Dr. Campbell replicated these studies and he found the exact same results. And so he had one of his research associates replicate the studies again and they found the exact same results. So then he went on to do what I call, this is my own term, the light switch studies. And it was a similar type of study, but he would take rats and he would put them on a high protein diet for three weeks and see if they developed cancer or precancerous lesions. And then he would put them on a low protein diet for three weeks and then back on a high protein diet and back down on a low protein diet. And what you can see here very clearly is that just like you can turn a light switch on or off, he could basically turn cancer on and off by putting them on a high protein versus a low protein diet. So I find this slide to be one of the most exciting slides in this whole slide deck because what this tells you if you or one of your loved ones has cancer is that not in every case, but in many cases, cancer can be turned back off. So it can go away. Not for everybody and not in every case, but in many cases it can go away, at least in this study. And so I'm gonna show some more evidence of this in humans a little bit later on. But the, while these studies were really interesting, there are a couple of things you start thinking about as a researcher. One of them is, <clears throat> well, rats aren't humans, so would we see the same results in humans? And then secondly, this study was done with casein, which is an animal protein. And Dr. Campbell wondered, is, is protein the issue here, or is it specifically animal protein? Because the plant kingdom has a lot of protein as well. <coughs> so what he decided to do is to replicate all these three studies, the light switch studies and the two I showed you before that, and instead of using casein, he did them all again using soy protein, and then he did them all again using wheat protein, both of which are plant-based. And what he found was that soy and wheat proteins did not cause any cancer or precancerous lesions at either a high or a low protein level. So the <coughs> issue here is not protein. Protein is not the problem. Animal protein, specifically, was the problem. And after doing all of this research, Dr. Campbell concluded that casein is the most relevant chemical carcinogen ever identified. But again, like I said, rats are not humans. And another thing I learned from him is that 90% of all animal studies don't play out in humans for various reasons. And so <clears throat> while rat, rat studies and studies that are done in Petri dishes called in vitro studies, they can be very interesting and can point arrows of where we might wanna go as researchers. Uh, you always want to look for humans and you always want to look for large human studies to see if these results are actually playing out. So I make a really big effort in my presentations to not just show you human research, but to try and get the largest studies I can find with thousands of patients so that we know that the results are likely to be very reliable. So I'm going to start by um, giving you some statistics and the next handful of slides are going to have quite a few statistics to make this point that yes, 
animal protein is indeed cancerous in humans. So the New York Cancer, the New York University Cancer Institute compared the diets of 250 breast cancer patients to about 500 women who did not have breast cancer. And they found that the cancer patients ate more meat, cheese, butter, and milk than those who didn't have cancer. The women who consumed more animal products had as much as three times the cancer risk of other women. Looking at red meat and breast cancer, <clears throat> in 2014, a Harvard study found that one serving a day of red meat during adolescence was associated with a 22% higher risk of premenopausal breast cancer. And one serving a day of red meat consumption in adulthood was associated with a 13% higher risk of breast cancer overall. And I think this is really important because there is, there are a lot of studies that indicate that um, what you do in your childhood and what you eat in your childhood and you know, the, the effects that are happening to you as an adult often started in childhood. And you can see right here that um, eating meat in adolescence was associated with a higher risk than people who started eating um, red meat as an adult. One of the things that we were talking about today uh, at Dr. Pitier's office is the importance of how you cook your meat because it seems that <clears throat> um, cooking meat is actually what's causing the problem. Cooking those proteins is causing cancerous compounds to be formed. So the Long Island Breast Cancer Study found that women who ate a more grilled, barbecued, or smoked meats have a 47% higher odds of breast cancer. The Iowa Women's Health Study, a really large study, found that women who ate their meat very well done had nearly five times the odds of getting cancer. This is because, among other things, something called heterocyclic amines that are produced through the process of cooking meat and they've been linked to cancer. And there are some other things as well, but that's a big one. So grilling, frying, and oven broiling large, uh, produce large amounts of heterocyclic amines. And if you always thought, well, I, I eat chicken because it's you know healthier, it's a white meat, it's not gonna be as bad for my heart and my cholesterol, my waistline, Chicken has been shown to form higher concentrations of these than other types of meat. So chicken is not, um, it might be better for your waistline and it might be better for your heart than a big steak, but it's not better for your cancer risk, most likely. Looking at colon cancer, strong links have been found between colon cancer and the consumption of alcohol, meat, and other fatty foods. Specifically, red processed meats are the biggest offenders. And I'm gonna talk about processed meats a little bit more in a few slides. But interestingly, just one 50 gram serving, so that's like one hot dog or a quarter breast of chicken of processed meat per day will increase your risk for colorectal cancer by 21%. Now, I don't know about you, I, I don't eat meat anymore, but when I did, a quarter breast of chicken was nothing. <laughs> I mean, I could eat a whole chicken breast, sometimes two at dinner alone. So um, we're not talking about a lot here. Looking at esophageal cancer, over the past 20 years, about 45 studies have examined the link between diet, Barrett's esophagus, which is a really diseased esophagus, and esophageal cancer. <clears throat> and the most consistent association with cancer was with the consumption of meat and with high fat diets. So I wanna turn now to what the American Cancer Society has to say about this, and the World Health Organization has the same list. At the American Cancer Society, if you go on their website, <clears throat> you can find this place where they talk about what are, what are known to be cancer causing. And they have different groups. So group one is what we call known human carcinogens. We know for a fact these things cause cancer in humans and there's no more discussion about it. Uh, group two is what we call probable carcinogens for humans. And that, those are things where, gosh, we've got a whole lot of data and these things are looking pretty bad but we don't have enough quite yet to move it up to group one, but you know, it's probably carcinogenic. And then there's group three and group four, which are less, less, uh, less research behind them. So in group one, again, is the known carcinogens to humans. These are gonna be things like arsenic, asbestos, smoking, radium, um, things like this, <laughs> radon. And in that group, you will also find processed meat, right up there with arsenic. <laughs> You will also find, I don't have a slide on it, but you will also find um, salted fish, like how the Chinese make it. These are things we know cause cancer in humans. And I don't know about you, I, I mean, I don't mean to get on like a political high horse right now in the middle of my lecture, but I see this and I see that the World Health Organization and the American Cancer Society have de deemed processed meats as carcinogenic and yet 
you know, Oscar Mayer and all these companies are still allowed to sell Lunchables to school children and, you know, Oscar Mayer sandwiches. And, you know, as, as adults, we might not be eating as much Oscar Mayer, but we like, um, you had a really good list today, you know, um, um, what's the Italian meat that everybody likes? Salami, prosciutto. Prosciutto, prosciutto, prosciutto yeah, yeah, prosciutto and salami and, and some of these things, you know, these are all processed meats and they're known undoubtedly to cause cancer. Under the list of probable carcinogens, um, <clears throat> we have red meat. So all red meats are considered a probable carcinogen. And you told a really great story today. Will you repeat that? Because it was so important. Sure. So the, the um, epidemiologists who actually were associated with um, reviewing over 800 peer-reviewed journal articles on um, the carcinogenic effects of processed meat and red meat said that had they waited just two months um, after uh, announcing that processed meat was a class one or a group one carcinogen, that red meat would have also been put into group one. Um, but but they had already made the announcement. It was just based on two more articles that they uh, subsequently um, had. So, so we can probably so we can, consider yeah, red, red consider meat it. <laughs> a, a known carcinogen as well. So, uh, and I encourage you to do your own research. Jump on the American Cancer Society website and look some of these things up because there are other things in, in these lists too that are quite um, alarming and, and raise your eyebrows as well. So I'd like to turn to dairy and eggs a little bit because um, often we are taught things like milk does the body good and eggs are the perfect protein. So let's find out what the literature has to say about dairy and eggs and cancer risk. So according to the National uh, Cancer Institute, dairy increases risk for breast cancer. When they evaluated dietary intakes of almost 2,000 women with breast cancer, they found that a high dairy intake, which in this case ended up being mostly cheese, had a 53% increased risk for estrogen, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. And for those with estrogen receptor negative breast cancer, those who drank the most milk increased their risk by 58%. And this is thought to be secondary to something called insulin-like growth factor one and other growth factors that are found in dairy. And I am going to get to that topic a little bit later. Looking at ovarian cancer in milk, the Iowa Women's Health Study found that women who consumed more than one glass of milk per day had a 73% greater chance of ovarian cancer than women who drank less than one glass a day. Now, one glass a day of milk is not a lot. Um, if you drink a couple bowls of cereal in the morning, you've probably done at least that, if not more, if you put milk on it. So um, a 73% greater chance of ovarian cancer is quite alarming, in my opinion. Turning to prostate cancer and skim milk, you can see here, again, something we don't see that often in science, you do see it, but pretty much a perfect correlation. Almost a one-to-one -one correlation here showing that the more non-fat milk that a person drank, the higher their risk of prostate cancer. And this is where it gets kind of interesting because we've also been told, hey, you know, milk is pretty fatty and has cholesterol and things in it, so it's a lot better to have non-fat milk. So, you know, back in the 90s or so, I think most of us, or many of us anyway, either switched to low-fat or non-fat milk. <clears throat> and that probably does do your heart a little bit of good and probably your waistline a little bit of good, but it does not do your cancer risk any good. And it makes sense because I've already told you about Colin Campbell's work with animal <coughs> proteins and casein in particular, which is very high in milk products. And if you think about a glass of milk, milk is primarily made up of two things. It's made up of fat and protein. So if you have fat and protein, but you take all the fat out to make non-fat milk, you now have pretty much a whole glass of animal protein which again we've shown is extremely carcinogenic. Looking at breast cancer in milk, we almost see the exact same one-to-one -one correlation. In this study, they were looking at different countries and the milk consumption per day by, by the country's uh, population. And it's interesting, you know, if you look around, you can see, um, you can see in the bottom, countries like Zimbabwe, Vietnam, um, Uganda, India, these are countries that often don't eat a lot of dairy products either because they can't afford to, they're quite poor and they can't afford to have livestock around, or because it's just not part of their culture. Like in Japan, they just don't eat a lot of dairy products. And so that's who you generally see down at the bottom, but up at the top you find countries like the US and Netherlands and Iceland, and these are countries that are often known for their dairy raising um, you know, farms and habits and things. So. Uh, you'll notice in the top right too, the same information, they looked at the same 
the same study looked at uterine cancer and they found pretty much the same correlation. So this held for both types of cancers. And we see the same thing looking at total fat intake with breast cancer. Now fat's interesting because fat's often been associated with breast cancer or with cancer risks in general, a lot of different cancers. Um, but often when you have somebody eating a high fat diet, they're also eating a high animal protein diet as well. And so there's not a lot of fat in the, in the vegetable kingdom, in the plant kingdom. There is some fat and there are a few things that are high in fat like avocados or nuts or seeds. But in general, plants and plant-based foods are very, very low in fat. And so in general, when you see fat studies and what they're correlated with, we now start wondering based on Helen Campbell's work, is it the fat that's causing the breast cancer or is it the associated animal protein that came with the fat that is associated? Um, but one thing I like about this study is that <clears throat> they showed that, that when, you know, a lot of people will look at this as I did and they'll say, oh, this must be genetics. Like Japanese have different genes from us and that's why they don't get breast cancer. And what they found is that when you take people from a country and they move or they migrate to a new country, like the Japanese come to the US, when they take on a US diet, then their risk becomes the same as the US population. So it's not a genetic issue, it's a diet issue. And that's been shown quite, quite clearly as well. Looking at fat and breast cancer, for women with, with metastatic breast cancer, so it's already spread past the breast, <clears throat> The risk of dying from the disease at any point increases 40% for every thousand grams of fat that are consumed monthly. I, don't, I can't remember what it is, but like a pint of Ben and Jerry's is something like 80 grams of fat or something. <laughs> so it might not take that long in a month to hit, hit 1,000 grams. So the typical American diet has about 60% greater risk than a low-fat vegetarian diet. Patients that were fed a standard American diet, which is about 40% of calories from fat, for about 10 weeks, and in that study, uh, breast tumors increased during this time. And then those patients were switched to a 10% fat diet and further tumor development stopped. So do you remember the light switch studies in the rats? This is your light switch study in humans. Looking at fat and pancreatic cancer, the National Institutes of Health and ARC um, combined to do a study with over 545,000 people. And they found that consumption of fats from all sources was significantly associated with pancreatic cancer risk, but no correlation was found with the consumption of plant, plant fats. So again, we're seeing a difference between, you know, like we saw with the proteins coming from animals and proteins coming from plants, we're seeing a difference between fats coming from animals and fats coming from plants as well. There's a great study out of Europe called the EPIC study. It stands for the European Prospective Investigation into Cancer and Nutrition. Uh, it was a study of almost 500,000 people. found a 72% increased risk of pancreatic cancer for every 50 grams of chicken consumed daily. Again, just a quarter of a breast, and that's chicken. And so again, once again, I'm trying to make the point um, with chicken that it's not as healthy as we might think it is specifically when talking about cancer. Looking at meat, uh, fish, and acute leukemia, there was a study in children in Taiwan that was interesting. I just found this article recently, and they found that the consumption of cured meat and fish more than once a week, I mean, that's nothing, more than once a week was associated with a 74% increase in acute leukemia. And now about eggs. So there's a lot of information on eggs in the, in the literature, and people aren't talking about this, and. <clears throat> So I'm gonna talk about it. People who consumed just one and a half eggs per week had nearly five times the risk of colon cancer compared to those who consume about one a month. Five times the risk. Another study suggests that even moderate egg consumption can triple the risk of developing bladder cancer. The intake, on the other hand, the intake of kale, cereals, cabbage, tangerines, and carrots were protected against bladder cancer. Another one on prostate cancer. In 2011, Harvard did a study in over 27,000 men without prostate cancer and found that those who consume just two and a half eggs per week, not per day or not for breakfast, but per week, increased their risk for metastatic prostate cancer by 81% compared with men who consume less than half an egg per week. So 
this all makes sense to me because if you stop and you think about baby cows, they're very different from baby humans. And all dairy products and, um, you know, whether it's milk or something that comes from milk, uh, like cheese or yogurt or sour cream, any of these things, um, when we're looking specifically at dairy products, you know, cow's milk is made up of 15% protein, and this is the casein protein that we were talking about, and that helps a baby calf double its birth weight in about 45 days. But a human's milk is only 5% protein, and a human baby doubles its birth weight in about 180 days. So cow's milk has 20 times more casein than human's milk, and we've just heard a lot about the effects of casein. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be doubling my weight in 45 days. Humans are not designed to do that. And it's been shown that, you know, when we started industrializing our food and we started, you know, putting a lot of growth hormones and things into our cows and, um, you know, all basically adulterating what would normally be a rather natural process. Um, children in our country started growing taller and taller and taller very fast. You know, like I was 5'9", um, I'm 5'8 now, but <laughs> I was 5'9 when I was younger. And, you know, my mom and all of her friends were like 5'1", 5'2", 5'3", and they just thought I was a giant, you know? And now I look around and I see these young girls who were like six foot, six foot one, and it's just amazing that we are growing so much. And uh, similarly, you know, women, are, it's thought that most most women should be starting their menses around the age of 17 or 18. That had traditionally been the right, like the normal age to start menstruating. But with the advent of factory farming and all of the hormones and everything that go into these products, the average age in the U.S. now is 11 or 11 and a half. But you go to countries where they don't have a lot of these products and it's still 16, 17, 18. So, it's not surprising me that we're seeing all this. Now, again, we've talked a lot, we haven't talked a lot, but I, I mentioned earlier that as scientists, we like to zoom in and see, okay, what specifically is causing the cancer? And let's figure out what that is so we can create a drug and make a lot of money on it. And so I don't wanna talk about all those things that they talk about with one exception. And that's something called insulin-like growth factor one or IGF-1. Now, when I talk about this, all you need to really focus on are the words growth factor and you'll get an idea for what this thing does. It's a hormone in the body. It's produced throughout your whole life, but it's produced in the highest levels when you're young. So when you're an infant, even when you're in utero, when you're young and you're growing, this is when you need to be having high levels of growth factor because you're growing. Your bones are growing, your organs are growing, your tissues are growing. So having IGF-1 circulating and fairly circulating in fairly high levels in your body when you're young is normal, and that's a good thing. But when you uh, become an adult, there's a point where you really don't need much IGF-1 anymore and you don't want it in your body because one of the things that IGF does is it not only grows your bones and your tissues and your organs, but it will also grow things like tumors. And so when, you know, it's normal that we get cancer cells and you've probably heard this before. You know, everybody's getting cancer cells here and there, but if you're healthy and you have a strong immune system, your immune system will go beep, 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 there's a cancer cell over in her left pinky, and they'll go right and they'll fix the cancer cell and they'll eat it up and it's gone. But when we don't have healthy bodies and our environments are either too diseased and our bodies are not able to fight the cancer fast enough, or we've got too many cancer cells growing and our body can't get them all, all at once, um, they will start to replicate faster than the body can kill them and eventually they'll replicate and replicate until you get a tumor and that tumor needs to be fed and it needs to be fed by blood vessels among other things but it needs things like growth factors to help, it, to help it grow so <clears throat> igf1 when you're an adult is something you don't want because it will help your cancer cells grow and something i find infinitely fascinating is that there's a syndrome called Laron syndrome and it's a rare form of dwarfism that's caused by the body, body's inability to produce this growth factor. People with this syndrome only grow to be a few feet tall, but they almost never get cancer. So that goes to tell you just how important IGF-1 is. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of research behind IGF-1. First of all, increased levels of IGF-1 in adults can lead to increased growth in cell, cancer cells like I talked about. The amount of IGF-1 produced in the liver is positively associated with a diet that's high in casein, so animal products, while low IGF levels are associated with a casein-free diet. And the only way to get a casein-free diet is to not eat any animal products at all, 
that would be called a plant-based diet or a vegan diet. <clears throat> in human studies, they show that premenopausal women with the highest circulating levels of IGF-1 have a seven-fold greater risk of breast cancer when compared to women who have the lowest rates of IGF-1. And men under 60 with the highest circulating levels of IGF-1 have a four-fold greater risk of prostate cancer when compared to men with the lowest rates of IGF-1. And women with high IGF-1 levels had a, also had a higher rate of getting colorectal cancer. Here's some great news though. After just 11 days, that's all it takes, of reducing animal protein in your diet, your IGF levels can drop by 20%. So if you're hearing all this and you're thinking, well, you know, gosh, I need to make some changes. The great news is that if you do make changes and you make some serious changes, depending on how, how your diet is looking at the moment, you can actually have a pretty big effect right away. But um, IGF, levels can, IGF levels increase with consumption of dairy and eggs as well as meat. So it's not just good enough to get rid of meat in your diet. You definitely want to get rid of the dairy and eggs, even including the low fat dairy and the egg whites. If you say, well, I just like egg whites, I don't eat the yolks. The egg whites have a lot of animal protein in them as well. So this goes with what I'm saying about the vegetarian versus the vegan diet, which I'll touch on in just a moment. The vegetarians don't achieve a significant reduction in IGF-1 levels with their diet, only vegans do. And so just to be clear, because some people are confused about this, a vegetarian diet means that the person's not eating any animal flesh at all. So no, no meat, no poultry, no fish. A vegan diet also does not eat any flesh products, but they also do not eat, animal, or eat any products from animals like dairy or eggs. So that's the difference between vegetarian and vegan. And so they're showing here that um, you will not get the same reduction in IGF-1 levels unless you get all of the animal proteins and the animal products out of your diet. Another great study from Dr. Kennedy I didn't know about. <laughs> um, the levels of IGF-1s in vegans was lower than in distance runners and not surprisingly lower, in, lower than meat eaters as well. So vegans were the green group, distance runners the orange group, and meat eaters the blue group. Um, you know, you can have somebody who's out running marathons and a vegan will still have lower IGF-1 levels. Okay, so hopefully I've made a, a good solid argument that animal protein and animal products are not healthy for your cancer risk. Whether you don't have cancer and you'd like to prevent it, or if you have cancer and you'd like to try to reverse it, I'm hoping now that you will really be compelled to take these animal products out of your diet or greatly eliminate them. But there's another piece to this puzzle as well that's really important, and that is the research behind plant-based foods. So I'm gonna start by just showing you a simple um, slide that I made. If you look on the top row, you see some things we don't really want in our diet on the left side, like fat, animal protein, cholesterol, and calories. It's not that you can't have a little bit of these things sometimes, but you don't want large amounts of these in your diet in general. And if you have cancer or heart disease or some of these things, you really want them very low levels. And if you go down to the left, you see that the things that are highest in those kind of quote bad qualities are meat, dairy, non-fat dairy, and eggs. If you keep going across the right, you see the things that have shown to be health helpful and healthy, like fiber, micronutrients, which would include your vitamins, your minerals, your antioxidants, your phytochemicals, and water. These are all found in plant foods like beans, grains, vegetables, and fruits. <clears throat> so I'm gonna start with fiber because fiber, um, there's a lot of <coughs> research behind the benefits of fiber when it comes to cancer. And fiber actually changes the type of bacteria that's present in your intestine, and that can reduce the production of cancer-causing bile acids. Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> Yale researchers found that premenopausal women who ate more than six grams of soluble fiber a day, that's about a cup of black beans, had 62% lower odds of breast cancer compared to those who only ate four grams. Um, and for estrogen receptor negative tumors, those are the harder ones to treat, they had 85% lower odds. That was just two extra grams of fiber. So fiber can have a really big effect with a small amount. So the more fiber, the better. A combination of 22 studies, we call that a meta-analysis, uh, found that there are there, there is a 14 to 15% lower risk of breast cancer for every 20 grams of fiber intake each day. So they studied this with breast cancer and found it helpful. High fiber intake may reduce the incidence of esophageal cancer by as much as a third. 
And if you start looking at the amount of fiber that people are eating, <clears throat> the average American woman eats less than 15 grams a day. Vegetarians eat about 20 grams a day. Vegans eat about 46. But what we call a whole food plant-based vegan, don't really like the word based because it implies that, well, it's based in vegetables, but you might have a little meat thrown in. So I'm just gonna call that a whole food plant diet vegan. They get 60 grams of fiber a day. And I'm just gonna take a moment to define that a little bit better because this is really the gold standard diet, in my opinion, um, especially for cancer patients, but really for anybody. A whole food plant diet would include anything from the plant kingdom and nothing from the animal kingdom. And it would have foods in their whole forms. So instead of eating corn chips, you would eat corn. <laughs> instead of eating potato chips, you would eat the whole potato. Um, you know, you get the idea. So you eat whole grains, whole beans, vegetables, fruits, anything, you know, ideally you just go to the produce section and you go to the bins where they have the, the rice and the beans. Anything in pretty bright packages that just look, I mean, take a wand out. Imagine that Michael Clapper taught me this if you've ever heard of him. He says, take a wand out in your head and go, that is not food. <laughs> <laughs> and so my husband and I, and we try first of all, not to shop when we're hungry because then you get really tempted by the bright, pretty packages. But you know, if you're walking down the bright, pretty package aisle because you have to get to the bathroom or something, just say to yourself, that is not food. <laughs> that is not food either. And just keep walking and then find yourself in the produce department where all the bright, colorful things there are free for you to eat. All right, so looking at phytates, uh, phytates are found in the seeds of plants, like whole grains, beans, nuts, and seeds. They can help the body eliminate excess iron, which can generate free radicals. <clears throat> and in vitro studies, this is actually really interesting, in vitro studies show that phytates inhibit the growth of virtually all human cancer cells tested so far. So what they do in these, in vitro means like in a petri dish essentially, it's not in an in a animal or a human model. And they'll take um, some type of cancer cell, for example, a colon cancer, and they'll take colon cancer cells and they'll put them in a little petri dish, and then they'll put different types of phytates on and see what happens. And, and over and over they find that the phytates will kill off the cancer cells. It's really kind of neat. And there's so many studies. I started actually creating slides for each of these studies, and then I realized there's so many of them that it just got um, reduced down to this little bullet point. But it is really interesting when you read the articles. And now I want to turn to soy because we're all told, of course, that if you know that soy has estrogens in it, and if you have breast cancer, especially, you shouldn't be eating soy. And so I just want to talk a minute about that because <clears throat> there were there was reason to believe that a long time ago because they did a study um, in rats where they gave them. You want to tell the st story about the study? Um, well, so around the 1970s and 1980s, they did a lot. They did some studies where they took some rats and they gave them breast cancer and then they put them in a, in a cage and fed them nothing but soy and their cancer grew. Um, it was for a rat, it was the equivalent of something like 50 servings of soy a day that they were consuming. And, um, and so because of these studies, all the doctors in the U.S. said, oh my gosh, because soy has these, these isoflavones, I'm not sure if you're going to get to this, it looks like phytoestrogen, soy must be like an estrogen feeding breast cancer. So they stopped, all the doctors told women to stop eating soy. Are you gonna go into all the studies that, that uh, showed that probably. it was okay? okay? And I'll pause at the end and then if whatever I didn't get, we can we can add to it. Um, but what I will add, <clears throat> I don't know, I'm always worried I don't explain this very well, but you have receptors and then you have molecules of estrogen that go and bind one to one. It's like one molecule per one receptor. And <clears throat> if you have a problem with breast cancer and you have a lot of estrogen flooding these receptors, that could be harmful. But what they now believe is happening when you eat soy, because of the research I'm about ready to show you, is that the plant estrogens, they're called phytoestrogens, the plant estrogens actually also go and bind to those receptors and I'm just gonna take a, an extreme example. If all of those receptors were bound with plant estrogens, then none of the other estrogen would have a place to bind. And plant estrogen does not cause cancer. So it's now thought that soy is probably helpful because it's actually blocking estrogen from binding with those receptors, at least as much estrogen it, that otherwise. Is that how, did I explain that well? Yes. Okay. 
Thank you. <laughs> so in women with breast cancer, um, those who ate the most soy lived significantly longer and had significantly lower risk of recurrence than those who ate less. <clears throat> and in, in medicine, when we use the word significantly, that actually has a deep meaning to it. <laughs> it means the statistics were run that showed that the results were not likely due to chance. Because if, you know, when you run a study, if you flip a coin three times, you might get heads three times, but statistically, the more times you flip that coin, the more you're gonna find 50% 50 time, 50 of the time it's heads and 50% tails. So when we say significantly, this, the numbers of patients were high enough and the statistics were run to show that the results were very unlikely to be due to, to uh, chance alone. <clears throat> Another study found that 90% uh, who ate the most soy after a breast cancer diagnosis were still alive after five years, compared with 50% who ate little or no soy. So I know I'm kind of talking about all these statistics and it can be hard to focus because I hear myself kind of rambling one statistic after another, but stop and look at that for a moment. <clears throat> another study found that 90% who ate the most soy after a breast cancer diagnosis were still alive after five years compared with those who ate little or no soy, only half were still alive. I find that really, really compelling. The Shanghai Breast Cancer Survival Study looked at over 5,000 breast cancer survivors. <clears throat> they looked at recurrence, breast cancer related deaths, and total mortality. And they found that soy intake was inversely associated with both recurrence and mortality. So when soy intake went up, recurrence went down. And when soy intake went up, mortality went down. They found a 32% lower risk of recurrence and a 29% reduction of mortality, and this was found in both estrogen receptor positive and negative cancers. And finally, there was a pooled analysis of three studies with um, about 9,500 breast cancer survivors, <clears throat> looking at two US cohorts and a Chinese cohort, so looking at people with different genetics. And they followed them for over seven years and found that soy consumption, again, was inversely associated with recurrence in uh, different countries and um, they found that those who ate more than 10 milligrams of soy, um, those, that was the highest decile of soy intake compared to the lowest, had a 36% reduced risk of recurrence and a 29% reduced risk of, of death due to breast cancer. So the authors concluded that just eating one to two servings of whole soy can reduce the risk of breast cancer recurrence by 25%. And oh my God, one more on soy. Um, <clears throat> Post-diagnosis, post soy food intake and breast cancer survival study, which was a meta-analysis, they, they looked at five different studies uh, combined and found that soy food intake after diagnosis, comparing the highest group versus the lowest group of intake of soy, found a reduced mortality, I should have written this in better, 16% and reduced recurrence of 26%. So I'm getting that number by 1 minus 0.84 and 1 minus 0.74. And this was protective again in both pre and postmenopausal women and for estrogen receptor positive and estrogen receptor negative breast cancer. So I don't know about you guys, I find this really um, interesting, especially when we find that there's a benefit in estrogen receptor negative cancers because that's so hard to treat or can be so hard to treat. The Long Island Breast Cancer Study found that women who ate more grilled, barbecued, or smoked meats have 47% higher odds of breast cancer. I already showed you that part of the study, but the other part is that those who also have low fruit and vegetable intake, so they're eating a lot of meat, like a keto diet or something, not a lot of vegetables, they had 74% higher odds of breast cancer. So looking at plants, <clears throat> in a study of 50,000 African-American women, when I say plants, I mean mostly fruits and vegetables. In a study of 50,000 African-American women, collard green consumption was associated with less breast cancer risk at all ages, and broccoli was especially protective, broccoli being uh, one of the cruciferous vegetables, and I'll list those on the next slide. Those who ate two or more servings of vegetables a day had a significantly decreased risk of estrogen and progesterone receptor negative cancer. That's just two servings a day. So that's, that's kind of hopeful to me that you don't have to eat you know, only salads or only broccoli and cauliflower your whole life. Uh, University of Oxford found the incidence of blood cancers so like leukemia and lymphoma, for example, among vegetarians is nearly half that of those who eat meat. 
And it's believed that sulforaphane, which is, respo is responsible, which is an active component in cruciferous vegetables. So here I've listed out the cruciferous vegetables, because I know we've all heard that term, but we might forget what they all are. Um, broccoli, cauliflower, kale, collard greens, watercress, bok choy, kohlrabi, rutabagas, turnips, arugula, radishes, and cabbage. <clears throat> Yale researchers found that women with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma who ate three or more servings a day of veggies had a 42% improved survival rate over those who ate less. And the Iowa Women's Health study also found that higher cruciferous vegetable intake was associated with lower risk of developing non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. We've already looked at this study in Taiwan of the children. They found that ate the most, uh, actually just one and a half servings of smoked fish or meat a, a week had higher, uh, higher um, risk of acute leukemia. They also found that those who had a higher consumption of vegetables and tofu was associated with a 44% decreased risk in acute leukemia. And treatment with resveratrol, which is found in the, the skin of red grapes and is also found in red wine, <clears throat> resulted in significantly lower tumor growth, decreased angiogenesis, and increased apoptotic index in mice. Like it's a little bit, um, detailed, but basically uh, lower tumor growth and feeding that, feeding those tumors and uh, having cell death. And I'm getting close to the end here of this section. Um, the Adventist Health Study too is a, it's a really interesting study. Uh, have you guys heard of the Blue Zones? Okay, so there's a book called The Blue Zones and they talked about these zones on the planet where people are living in very high numbers to be over 100. And so they looked at these communities and said, what are these people doing that's allowing them to live so long? And <clears throat> one of those communities was actually in the United States, which surprised me because I'm always thinking that we have such a terrible diet. But that community was in Loma Linda, California. And if you know anything about Loma Linda, California, it's, a, it's kind of a hot seat for Seventh-day Adventists. And as part of their religion, they do not eat meat. Some of them, of course, do, but in general, they're, they're told not to. And so they have a high percentage of vegetarians in their population, and quite a lot of them are also vegan. And so it's really great to be able to study them because we can look at people who are, you know, living in the sunshine of California and everything else, and they are either eating meat, not eating meat, or not eating meat, or any dairy products or eggs. And we can see um, in a large population what's happening. So almost 70,000 people in this study were tracked for over four years. And vegetarians, which in the study included anyone not eating meat, so this included the vegans, they had a 24% lower risk for GI cancers, that's gastrointestinal cancer. <clears throat> vegans specifically had a 16% decreased risk for all cancers, and vegan women had a 34% decreased risk for female-specific cancers like breast cancer, ovarian, and uterine cancer, compared to those who ate meat. <clears throat> so, I haven't had a moment yet to talk about epigenetics, but I'm going to because I think it's really important. I just have one slide on it. Epigenetics is kind of a new, a fairly new field. And I bring this up because we are taught, especially when it comes to cancer, that really you can't do anything about your risk of cancer. It really has to do with your genes. So you just have to hope that mom and dad gave you good genes. And in fact, we know that that's in general not the case. Now genes can definitely increase your risk, but just because you have a gene that puts you at a higher risk for a certain cancer does not by any means mean that you're destined to get that cancer. <clears throat> and I'll give you a great example. Most of you are probably familiar with the BRCA gene, BRCA gene. If you didn't know this, BRCA gene stands for breast cancer. Um, <clears throat> I didn't know that for a long time, <laughs> which sounds silly now. But um, people think that if you have if you have a mutation in that gene that you are destined to get cancer. And in fact, Angelina Jolie became particularly famous for having a double mastectomy and, and having both of her breasts removed because she was so fearful that she would get breast cancer like her mother and die early. But interestingly, when you look at the research, <clears throat> they've shown that of the women who have the, the BRCA gene, by the time they're 70 years old, only half of those women will have breast cancer. And by the time they're 80 years old, it's about 75 to 80%, is that correct? Will have breast cancer. So there's still about a third that, well, maybe about uh, a quarter that by the age of 80 that will not get breast cancer. So it does not mean that if you have these genes that you will get breast cancer. But the question is, how do you know if you're gonna get it? And you don't necessarily know 
But like I alluded to earlier with the light switch studies, it does seem like we can turn cancer on and off. And <clears throat> when we talk about epigenetics, epigenetics is the study of, this is a layman's way of explaining it, but it's the study of what turns your genes on and off. So if we simplify it, you can think of your, your, your genome as having some good genes and some bad genes, and you wanna turn all your good genes off so they'll protect you, and you wanna turn all your bad genes off. That would be ideal. So if you do have a gene like the breast cancer gene, if you can turn it off, then you're not gonna get cancer. This is how we're starting to understand epigenetics. And it's a really new field. So what I'm saying is very simplified and may have mistakes because we're still learning it. But interestingly, um, Dean Ornish, who actually was made, he made himself very famous by being the first person to ever prove that you could reverse heart disease, like take plaque that's in your arteries and get rid of it without doing surgery. And he showed you could do that with a low fat vegan diet. He then went on to look at prostate cancer. And in this study, he looked at men who had prostate cancer who were switched to a low fat, whole food, vegan diet. And what he found is that 48 good genes were turned on and 453 bad genes were turned off. So we know that by changing your diet, you can change your genetic risk as well, which probably explains the light switch studies. That's my opinion. <clears throat> So finally, in women with the breast cancer gene, those who, oh, I just got this slide today. Thank you, Jill. Um, so I haven't actually read this study. That's full disclosure. I just read the abstract because Jill showed this to us. But in women with the breast cancer gene, those who ate up to 27 different fruits and vegetables a week, and they, this is quoted from the study, and variety does seem to be important here, they saw their risk of breast cancer diminish by 73%. So I think that's, um, I don't know, it inspires me to not only eat a plant-based diet, but to get lots of different fruits and vegetables into my diet. Sometimes we get simple and we have the same things we like to eat over and over, but really push yourself to go to the produce section and you know, try to put 10 different vegetables into your salad and see how, many, uh, see how much variety you can get in every week. Now, a really important point here is that it's not, it's the plants that are causing this, it's not the supplements. And this goes back to my whole point of zooming in before, how we try to say, oh, we'll zoom in and if we just fix the vitamin D issue or if we just fix this other issue here with omega-3 and just take a pill for it, we'll fix the problem. <coughs> but that never seems to work. Um, in one study, a higher dietary intake of antioxidants was associated with significantly lower lymphoma risk. But in that study, those who took supplements instead, it did not work for them. And we've seen that combinations of antioxidants like vitamin A, vitamin E, beta carotene, and pill form were actually associated with increased risk of death. So um, supplements contain only a select few antioxidants, whereas your body relies on hundreds of them all working synergistically. And that's one of the things I said very early on in this lecture, that there's so many reactions and things happening in your body. It's like a big, big symphony. And, um, my clapper, the one who gave me the wand thing, that is not food, he gave this great analogy. He said, I want you to imagine that you have this huge symphony and all of these professional players are playing together and they're making this beautiful music. And then this really wealthy donor comes in and they said, hey, I'm gonna donate all this money to your symphony, but I was a French horn player, so I'm gonna buy you 300 brand new high-end French horns and I'm gonna pay the salaries for all 300 of your French horn players because I love French horns so much. Now, can you imagine how that symphony is going to sound <laughs> with 300 additional French horn players? It doesn't work like that. And that's how the body is. The body has so many beautiful things going on inside of it, so many intricate reactions that when we as humans and scientists go in and think that we can try to fix something or that we can outsmart nature and all of her intricacies, we're, it turns out we're almost always wrong. So <clears throat> I guess I just say that it's eating the, the plants eating the whole plant in their natural form that is helpful in this case. And it's not just getting rid of the mate, which I talked about earlier. In one study they showed there may be as much as an eightfold difference between a high vegetable, low meat diet and a high meat, low vegetable diet. And some really good news is that eating healthy works really fast. Researchers had women eat a healthy diet and exercise for just two weeks. And after two weeks, they took some of their blood from before they started their diet and took some blood from after their diet. 
and put them on breast cancer cells in petri dishes, and they found that the blood from after they changed their diet um, suppressed cancer, cancer, cancer growth significantly better and killed 20 to 30% more cancer cells than the blood taken from the same woman two weeks before. So I was gonna do this interlude here, which I've already alluded to earlier, which is, gosh, there's a lot of information here. Um, a lot of information that shows that meat and dairy and egg products may not be good for you. In fact, in my opinion, they're absolutely terrible for you. And that plant and, and everything from the plant kingdom are really good for you. But again, if that's all true, why haven't I heard this before? And so I've already mentioned this, that you know these marketing budgets <laughs> that happen with meat and dairy councils or companies like Nabisco and Kraft and all these people, I mean, they have so much money behind that that they make sure that if they can run a little five person study that show that chocolate's healthy, you are definitely gonna hear about it and you're gonna hear about it 15 times in the next two, two weeks. And, and then we all run around going, hey, did you hear chocolate's healthy? Well, butter's back, butter's back, did you hear butter's back? You know, and we all get excited about these things, but we know intuitively, and I know you know this too, that when you see something like that, you wanna get excited about it, but there's something in your head saying, I hope butter's back and I hope chocolate's healthy and I hope wine's healthy and all these other things that you just know intuitively are looking a little bit skeptical. And there has never been any question about the health benefits of fruits and vegetables. And so <clears throat> I guess I just have that little interlude to remind you of why, if this is new to you, why it might be new to you. So I'm gonna finish by telling you how to get started and um, giving you just a few things to, um, a few, sorry, like books and videos and things that you can go look, look <coughs> for. So first of all, there's a couple ways to go. And one is to take it in steps and go slowly. And the other one is to go fully plant, go for a fully plant diet 100% um, overnight. And I'll tell you, I did the latter. <laughs> a lot of people feel like they can't. And so if you choose to take it in steps, there are many ways you can try this. You can go meatless on Mondays, that's been a popular step. You can try eliminating red meat for like, let's say a month, and then once you've gotten used to that, then you eliminate poultry for a month, and then eliminate fish for a month, and just go, go slowly and so you can kind of get used to these things. Or you can simply cut back without eliminating. I have a friend who lost 65 pounds and eventually went fully plant-based by, um, by just asking herself every time she was about ready to eat, is there a healthier choice that I would be available to right now? So if she was standing in front of the Ben and Jerry, she'd say, okay, <laughs> is there a healthier choice? And then she'd say, okay, maybe some frozen yogurt with the M&Ms on top. Okay, and then she'd say, should I leave the M&Ms off and maybe put some granola on top? I could do that, you know, she'd say, all right. What about going to sorbet, you know? Mm, if I can have the granola on top, okay. <laughs> What about some fruit? No, not doing fruit, no, you know. So she would just keep going until she got to that place where she just said, no, nope, I'm not agreeable to that option, it has to be here. And she just kept making better and better and better decisions until her whole diet had changed. So th those are perfectly legitimate ways to move yourself toward a plant diet. <clears throat> However, I feel like I need to say, and just because I know the research so well, that if you have cancer, I don't recommend that. I mean, I, I, and I feel like I have to say that because it, while it's better than sticking with the standard American diet for sure, if you know you have cancer and your life is on the line, then I feel like I have to recommend the right side, which is go plant-based and just do it. Um, there's so much motivation out there. There are so many options out there that can help you make it happen. And if you're gonna go 100%, that means of course you're gonna be eliminating all types of meat, dairy and eggs. And to feel your best, of course, eat whole, unprocessed foods. <clears throat> at, the health, uh, at the Whole Food store, they have a line in their deli called Health Starts Here. And that line, um, sometimes it's just called HSH, so it'll say like HSH quinoa salad or something. Anything that says Health Start Here should be uh, fully whole food, plant-based, uh, with no oil. Um, so there are ways to do it, and there are a lot of a lot of resources, and I don't have time to talk about them all here, but I did, by the way, leave my card on the back, so if anybody wants to contact me and ask me questions, you're welcome, and I'll, I'll be happy to help you. But some of my very, very favorite things to recommend are these books here on the left. The China Study is the one on cancer. <clears throat> it's actually, I, I met Colin Campbell. Um, I've met him a few times, but I got to talk to him last week at a, at a conference, and 
He told me that the China study has now broken a world record, although I did wonder about the Bible. <laughs> he said it's broken a world record for the um, book that's been published in the most languages. And it was most recently published for Swaziland, which I thought was fascinating. So again, this information, if it's new to you and you're thinking, I haven't heard this before, it is getting out there. And the fact that his book is now made that world record tells you that more and more people are hearing this information. The Food Revolution is the one that made me go vegan overnight. <clears throat> How Not to Die by Michael Greger is a fantastic book that has a whole big section on cancer. Eat to Live by Joel Fuhrman is always um, a really great one as well, and Diet Free in America by John Robbins. Videos, uh, Forks Over Knives is fantastic, and What the Health is also really good. There's one of those apps, kind of like the Netflix app that you can get a monthly subscription to called FMTV. It stands for Food Matters TV. <clears throat> they have a ton of documentaries of people who have gone plant-based in various forms, like raw food or you know vegan or whatever, and and they show how they did it. I found that really inspiring. And then there are a lot of videos, and I know this is a little controversial, but there's um, videos like The Minion, which have nothing to do with health, <laughs> but they have to do with the other side of veganism, which is like what's happening to the animals in the factory farms, or what's happening to the environment due to our factory farms. And the reason why I bring this up <clears throat> is that if you're struggling to find motivation, like you're really, really wanting to go plant-based because you've seen the evidence, you know it's the best thing for you, it's, you know it's the best thing for your cancer risk, but boy, you're just struggling so hard. Sometimes when you see what's happening to the environment or you see what's happening to the animals, it gives you all the motivation you need. And I will tell you that 17 years ago, I went vegan overnight, and I'm not kidding when I say this, you'll laugh, but I'm really not kidding. My four food groups, the day before I went vegan, were Swiss, Havarti, cheddar, and chocolate. <laughs> I mean, I loved my dairy. And the minute I moved out of my mom and dad's house and was responsible for feeding myself every day, it was always cheese hoagies and macaroni and cheese and fettuccine Alfredo and frozen yogurt with M&Ms on top. It was all dairy. And then I read something about the animals in the factory farms and it, it touched me so deeply that I never ate it again. So that's why I bring that up. I don't mean to get political on anybody, but it can be very helpful and getting you to motivate yourself to change your diet. And then two websites I highly, highly recommend. Nutritionfacts.org is run by Michael Greger, who wrote the book, How Not to Die. <clears throat> that website has over a thousand videos now, maybe thousands, I don't know, but these little short five to six minute videos on all kinds of topics as they relate to health. And so you can look it up like breast cancer, estrogen receptor negative, um, and just see what he's got to say about that. And they're all, very highly researched and really informative, and he's kind of entertaining himself. <clears throat> and then perhaps, for those of you who are thinking you're a little bit overwhelmed by the idea of making all these changes, perhaps your very best um, resource will be Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. It's pcrm.org. There are other websites that have a, a similar thing, but they have something on their website called the 21 Day Kickstart Program. So if you're thinking, I don't even know how to start, I don't even know what to buy, I don't have recipes, where am I gonna get Just go there, because that's got 21 days full of recipes and menus and shopping lists, and you can just go to the store in the morning tomorrow and just get started, and if you like the food and everything's great, and after 21 days you're thinking, what am I gonna do? You just go back to day one and start over again. They make it easy. <clears throat> Here are some pictures of those. And then just to show you how good um, vegan food can be. This first one, of course, comes with a caveat because it's high in fat, but this is a fully vegan burger, and I promise you it tastes every bit as good as it looks. It was so yummy. <laughs> but on a healthier note, um, this is my husband's favorite. It's a vegan paella, and I put some tofu in there, a vegetable ceviche, a tomato and, and pepper and eggplant stack, that is a cauliflower and spinach um, curry. That was Valentine's Day. <laughs> that was a, a macadamia nut and crusted tofu uh, with wild rice and a red pepper and salad. <clears throat> and many people think, well, I like to entertain. What am I going to do? Guess what? <laughs> Everybody gets to eat healthy with you. So you can certainly make you know, your desserts look beautiful. And, and you can still have nachos. These nachos, I if you get the baked chips with no fat, these um, these nachos were fully oil-free and other than some cashews and the cheese, they were fat-free and they're really yummy. 
And this was just some kind of mushroom vegetable thing I made. I don't even remember how I made it, but I wish I did because it was yummy too. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna finish with a quote. And that quote is that if diet is wrong, medicine is of no use. If diet is correct, medicine is of no need. So I'll open it up for questions and see if anybody has any. I know Dr. Pinier might, might, you know, she's the MD here, so hopefully she'll be willing to answer some too. <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Jill. This was amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs>